All right. So um, I know the focus of this uh, of conference, of course, uh, is uh, COVID and, and uh, other current infections. So um, I'm going to start with COVID, but we're going to get to some other uh, juicy stuff. So let's get let's get started. Uh, so the learning objectives will be, first of all, to talk about um, be able to describe current respiratory disease outbreak trends, Idaho and the U.S. Um, you've heard a lot about it, so I'm going to try to just introduce a few new things and some latest things and not, uh, not rehash stuff you guys are well familiar with. Um, list several other outbreaks and disease occurrences, so not in the respiratory family um, and not, not in the respiratory viral family, I should say. Uh, that could impact Idaho that we need to be aware of, keep our eyes peeled for future. And then uh, lastly, um, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to describe progress and challenges in implementing some of our prevention measures against several of these infectious diseases where we're um, struggling along or with, with some good success and some uh, partial success. First of all, I took this picture yesterday. <laughs> I was, you know, you hear about uh, drug shortages or, you know, a lot of people out with respiratory illness and then you uh, you wander through a pharmacy uh, and you see the shelves and how incredibly empty they are and you realize how real this is for people. Um, there's very little left um, in this area. Um, this is a, which I was not even aware of, this is a special uh, cold medication for people who have heart conditions, which I had never really noticed on the shelf before, but that's been left over. Um, and, um, you, you can see, and then the airborne stuff down there, the, the homeopathic, uh, seems to be less popular, but anyway, clearly a big demand, uh, when the stores can't keep up and keep these things in, in stock. So let's start again with COVID. Um, I always, we joke about the green map and the red map. I'm sure many of you have the same thinking. So are things okay or are they really bad? Uh, and um, I just wanted to bring this up. I know you guys are familiar with the map, but to point out that we continue to live in this world where messages are, uh, and we've talked with the CDC is aware of this. Uh, we've talked with this, this is the one, the green map is the one that the general public is supposed to be using to help guide uh, their day-to-day -day actions. Should I wear a mask? Do I need to wear a mask? Do I need to be concerned about my personal risk? Um, and the one on the right is supposed to be used more in healthcare settings and is based more on um, the percent positivity. So really looking at how much disease is out there. And I think this one is a little bit of marker of, uh, even if there's less disease out there, if it's get, hitting people really hard and the hospitals are getting really full, that means that it's a nasty strain, let's say, and I need to, to take more precautions. So it's, it's a little counterintuitive. I've never loved these. Uh, but I understand how we got to this place. So that's this week's maps. And you can see that Idaho, from a community level standpoint, is looking pretty good. And we'll talk about hospitalization rates for COVID uh, coming up. So you'll see how we ended up in this place. Um, whereas if you look at our percent positivity around the state, uh, we certainly are seeing transmission and a lot of, a lot of red, although not nearly as much as uh, other parts of the country. So what is our percent positivity for COVID right now? Here's our uh, chart we have up on our web page. Um, and you can see here that right now we're sitting a little low, but below that 10% you saw in those charts, above our, our target of below 5%, that's actually our target. Uh, you can see that we're kind of kind of bumping along here at about 8%. We thought uh, just a week or so ago that we were really starting to see an increase. And now we're seeing a, a potential flattening or um, and you'll see a lot of the data is, is looking like this with COVID. Kind of hard to say right now uh, if we're really starting to take off or if this is just a little bit of a, a, a bump. So what about our case reports? This is the uh, national data. And you can see here just very recently, the last couple of weeks, a bump in cases, but nothing super dramatic like what we saw with the, the last really big wave, the Omicron wave last winter. Nothing like what we saw the kind of a week to week over week increases, but definitely a little bit of a bump here in Idaho. Again, we have lower numbers overall, so maybe a little bit more uh, variation week to week. But you can see here we seem to be kind of bumping along, certainly look a little higher than we did uh, a few weeks ago, but uh, nothing dramatic at this moment. So what about hospital admissions? Of course, that's what we really care about, if you will, as severe COVID, that's what we're trying to prevent right now. Um, and you can see here that actually uh, hospital admissions for COVID actually declined very slightly 
um, from the week before. Uh, again, um, sometimes you see that gray shading always indicates maybe the state is a little bit preliminary, but um, certainly doesn't look like a, a, a sustained increase. Same thing as what we're seeing in Idaho. Actually, we've been seeing a little bit of a, of a decrease in our hospitalization. So uh, hopefully that's good news, but uh, obviously we got a long respiratory season and that's still to go. So what about those numbers in Idaho? If you look at COVID admissions again, kind of what you were seeing there, uh, kind of a little bit of a rise. We thought, okay, things are really starting to take off. And this is the blue bars here. And now it's kind of settled down a little bit or mellowed out a little bit. Whereas influenza, definitely we've seen, we'll talk about flu next, of course, uh, we've definitely seen a, quite a dramatic increase here week over week in the number of people being admitted for influenza. Um, meanwhile, um, of course, we're keeping a close eye on China um, and with the relaxation of their zero COVID policy, uh, been waiting to see if we see a huge surge of cases over there, which then of course could spawn new variants and new new activities around the world. And this has been quite interesting. Now, what, now how reliable this data is, is, is not clear, of course. Uh, they definitely did seem to see a bump a few weeks ago, and now it seems to maybe be dropping. Um, I think most people are uh, expecting to see huge surges out of China. A lot of complicated reasons for that. Um, partly that their vaccine that they've been using is not as effective. Uh, they, they do not allow the mRNA vaccines in China. They are using mostly Chinese uh, derived uh, vaccines, which have pretty good efficacy. Uh, but not as uh, are not as effective as the mRNA vaccines and are thought to be not as durable. Uh, in addition, they have an interesting phenomenon in China, which is that amongst their elderly, there is especially high not only vaccine hesitancy among the um, elderly population, but also providers are less likely to uh, promote and uh, recommend it for their elderly patients. So they even though their overall vaccine rates are higher um, than the U.S., um, their, their seniors are, are more vulnerable, less protected, um, and they do not have um, uh, updated vaccines at this moment. So a really uh, delicate moment for China, China right now and a lot of concern about what they'll be facing in the coming weeks and months. Um, so that's to be seen. So what about vaccinations? Um, as you can see here, um, a lot of enthusiasm for that vaccine initially, um, bumps as um, booster recommendations came out and so forth. And most recently here, uh, this is the bump once the bivalent booster was recommended, but you can see there that has dropped dramatically um, in the US. So right now, uh, very, steady trickle, but um, low numbers of people getting um, their booster shots. So where are we at? Uh, this is, there are three maps that kind of tell the story. This is the percent of the population, uh, five years and older, who are all recommended to get the bivalent booster dose. And you can see here, um, really the Southeast stands out as having very low uptake overall of the bivalent booster. Uh, and Idaho is slightly below, you know, 12%, uh, which is uh, quite low, of course, but so is the national uh, average of 14%. Looking at the middle graph of all adults, um, again, um, we see a little bit of a bump to 14.5%, um, and the U.S. is only at 16%. Really pretty, I, I think most of us get it that people are tired of COVID, but I'm still surprised how low this, these numbers are. Lastly, um, our, our seniors, if you will, uh, 65 and older, um, and there, um, I think it's interesting that CDC, they've set a very low bar here for being in the highest category, which is if at least 25% of the, pop, of the seniors have had a, a booster that's in the, the, and I know that's mathematically determined, but it really speaks to how low the national rate is. Um, so the country looks good if you just look at the color, but really only a little over a third of, of seniors have had a boost, a bivalent booster. And this is kind of interesting to me. This has been throughout the pandemic, an interesting phenomenon to me. While we have lagged in general with COVID uh, vaccination rates, amongst our seniors, we've actually always done uh, the same or better than the national average. And I would love for someone to um, figure that out because I don't quite 
quite know how we do that. Um, I'd be interested in hearing some of your all's thoughts about this, uh, but uh, we are, are actually sitting a slightly above the national average right now as far as our seniors. But we have a long way to go in, in really all those age groups. So one of the reasons for the hesitation, of course, is that we can, we've been talking about getting vaccinated now for several years and people have gotten tired of the constant uh, one more dose, one more dose, one more dose, and now the bivalent, one more dose. Um, and the question is, do they even work? Um, as you all know, the bivalent boosters were not tested in any sort of trials. They were based on neutralizing antibody um, titers, you know, obviously the best guess of scientists based on what strains they were thinking might be circulating this fall. Um, but um, that doesn't say that it's gonna work, especially uh, because they did not predict, um, they were thinking, they were aiming for uh, Omicron subvariant B, uh, dot, uh, uh, BA.4 and dot .5 and instead we have these sub lineages of those which have um, drifted away as it were. Um, so not clear at all that these were gonna actually work. Uh, they, there was a, some neutralizing antibody titer data available, but now we have just as of the 16th, so that was just last Friday, we do have this study that just came out um, from CDC um, saying, uh, which was finally looking at what we care about again, which is effectiveness in preventing um, COVID associated emergency department, urgent care encounters and hospitalizations. This only looked at immunocompetent adults. They are looking, um, we, will, we will soon get data hopefully on immunocompromised people and on children and other groups, but this is the first data to come out uh, looking at the um, uh, ability of the bivalent vaccine to prevent more severe disease. So it's nice to have something to look at. And what this study did, it was in nine different states a data, looking at data just from September, mid-September. So this is a couple weeks after the bivalent vaccine became available uh, through November 18th. And they, they grouped patients into either unvaccinated completely uh, vaccinated. You have to have at least two doses to be considered vaccinated. So two, three, or four. Um, or vaccinated plus having had a bivalent booster dose, um, at, again, as per recommendations, at least 60 days after their last monovalent dose. So you're looking at these three groups and then they compared uh, the odds of having had received, vac this is called a test negative design. So these patients are all presenting with COVID-like illness. And uh, what is the chance of them having, having been vaccinated or having received a booster? Um, uh, if they tested positive versus testing negative. Um, so what did they find? So what the study found was that the vaccine effectiveness of the bivalent dose uh, against emergency department or urgent care counters was about 56% compared with unvaccinated. So I don't need to tell you that that was um, a disappointing result. I'm sure they hoped for better um, vaccine effectiveness than that, but it is still, uh, you know, if you told me if I wear my seatbelt, I'll reduce my risk by half of uh, get, you know, getting injured in a car accident, I would certainly wear that seatbelt, but it's not what they were hoping for, uh, clearly. Um, and you can see there that uh, for folks that had at least gotten um, a monovalent dose uh, more than uh, so quite remotely, <laughs> um, if they had gotten it a long time ago, it was still about half, um, of, of, so pretty good efficacy still. And for folks that had gotten a fairly recent monovalent dose, so within the last two to four months, um, there's less added protection as it were. Um, of, so now you have about a 31% vaccine effectiveness of going ahead and still getting a booster. So hopefully this is the kind of data that will help you all if you get patients say, hey, I had a bunch of vaccines. Do I really need this bivalent booster? Now we have some data to say, yeah, we, we, can, we can show you that even if you'd had you know, a couple doses of monovalent, um, even if that was four months ago, there's still benefit uh, to getting the bivalent booster. The second bullet point there talks about hospitalization, and you can see there very similar numbers actually. Um, hospitalization was uh, um, prevented about, it was about 57% effective uh, uh, compared to unvaccinated people. Or uh, if your last dose was uh, more than 11 months earlier, about a 45% protective, they were not able to give a number for the uh, more recent monovalent dose 
Um, they suppress that data, I believe, because of just having not enough patients in that category to do a, a comparison. So, um, so that I hope that's helpful to you talking to patients about getting that COVID booster, because <laughs> we certainly need some enthusiasm in that in that area. So let's say influenza. So as uh, you all know, very high activity, including in Idaho, we are actually purple. Um, so the very highest category. Um, however, the good news with flu, and I'll show you a couple of data points there, is that it does appear that um, this is the uh, percent of outpatient visits for um, uh, respiratory illness reported by the ILI net uh, data. And you can see there, it appears we now have two data points suggesting that perhaps that has peaked. Uh, now, looking at prior seasons, you can see seasons where we have multiple peaks. So none of us would, would want to start messaging that, you know, the flu season seems to be behind us, especially since traditionally uh, January, February are some of our hardest hit uh, months usually for influenza. But it's good news nonetheless to see a little bit of a, of a decline here. So what about the Idaho data there? Um, you can see here um, that we've had, um, and I will tell you this number is going to increase. Uh, I think, I don't know when we're updating this week. We haven't updated it yet, but we, we have seen quite a few influenza related deaths come through uh, in addition to this. So this will, this will go up this week when our numbers get uh, finalized. Um, you can see here that our percent of influenza like illness, this is probably why we're in the purple. We're continuing to see very high um, ILI visits um, and including in the emergency department uh, from our emergency department data. So we we have not yet seen a peaking. Uh, it, again, obviously there's always a lag with data, uh, but at least from what we see in the numbers, we don't see evidence of that yet. So what about flu uh, vaccine? We were kind of discouraged with our COVID vaccine. Are we doing any better with flu? Uh, so compared to uh, last year uh, by week, uh, just looking at um, this this particular graph, it, you'll see we have different data for kids than we do for adults. This this type of data is only available for children right now. But if you look at the children data, a vaccine. Oh, good gosh, a vaccine by week. Uh, you can see here that maybe we've got a, a little bit of a slight edge. I would love to see that uh, come out a little further. But uh, I'm happy to see that we don't see a big drop off, which is which is what I was worried about. But uh, nonetheless. Um, we do see that uh, children six months to 17 years were looking about on par with last year. What about overall? However, it doesn't look as good with adults. And I am, this is, so I, I, I was putting this data together yesterday when I saw this very low number. I am actually worried if there's some data error here, uh, but nonetheless, it is starkly low. Um, among the flu vaccination among adults, uh, what the CDC data is, is showing right now is that we're at 19% uh, compared to, for example, Utah at 31 and Washington at 50%. I, I actually have talked to staff here and we're gonna be checking into this to make sure there's not some sort of a data error, but um, if it's real, um, this this confirms uh, one of, well, this would help support one of my concerns is that as people get COVID vaccine fatigue, they're just getting vaccine fatigue in general, and we might actually see uh, people not uh, not going near the pharmacy or near their physician's office in case they get uh, get uh, <laughs> pressured to get both. Um, I don't know what's happening here, so we are going to keep a very close eye on this and see if our our adult flu vaccine rates really are as low as they appear to be in the CDC data right now. An interesting side note, I'm trying to throw a few things in here you may or may not have heard yet. As you know, the flu vaccine is quadrivalent, has been for several years that we don't even offer, there's no uh, trivalent vaccines left on the market. Uh, but interestingly, um, influenza B, uh, the Yamagata lineage is uh, maybe extinct. Um, apparently it was already kind of petering out prior to the pandemic. As you know, the pandemic shoved influenza aside uh, for you know a year or, or a little bit more. It seems like we had reduced influenza circulation, and it seems like uh, Yamagata may may be extinct. This would have very real impact. I I would be surprised if the WHO and and or I should say the CDC they usually look to WHO, but for this particular issue in the United States, I don't know if they would consider going back to a trivalent vaccine. I think they'll 
give it a little more time. Uh, but as you can see from this is, uh, I just pulled this off the CDC website. There have been no Yamagatas detected so far this season and, and none since uh, really uh, March of 2020. So the very beginning of the pandemic. So keep an eye on that. It'll be interesting to see if we uh, are end up going back to a trivalent vaccine. Uh, RSV, uh, I'll just quickly go through this. You guys are, are well aware. Um, it does look like, I want to point out, it does look like the numbers are starting to come down as far as the percent, this is U.S. data, percent positivity, and the number of detections. Oopsie, I'm going backwards. Okay. In Idaho, uh, maybe we're seeing the same. It's kind of holding steady around 20% 20, 20 positive uh, tests that uh, um, are being reported to us about 20% are positive for RSV. So that's um, high, um, but at least it has uh, maybe, maybe peaked and starting to uh, settle down. Hospitalizations data for RSV, Idaho is one of the states we don't, we don't get that data at the health department. We're hoping that that will change. Um, I think hospitals are realizing more the importance of giving data to public health. I think that might change. But for right now, what we do is we look at the national hospitalization rate for RSV, which has dropped. And these are some of our neighbor states. Um, California, Colorado is the orange line there. Oregon, Utah, everybody's seeing the same thing, starting to see a drop in um, hospitalization. So we're hopeful that that's what we're going to see. Um, looking at, this is what this, now you take that U.S. data I just showed you and, and compare it to previous seasons, and you can see not only was it, of course, very early, uh, but also really compressed. So um, even though the whole season isn't over yet, we usually see it more spread out. It just appears that it all hit in a very hard wave, uh, putting great pressure on the hospitals, um, as we all know. Um, and then here we have it by age group, and you can see that by far the hospitalization rate was highest in uh, very young children, age uh, zero to four. With the next group, of course, as most of you are well familiar with being seniors who can be quite vulnerable to uh, uh, RSV as well. And uh, you've seen the news that, uh, that this has put great stress on the pediatric system. And one thing I think I wasn't fully aware of really till this month or uh, these discussions we've been having with the hospitals is that the the uh, the ability to expand capacity is much more limited in the pediatric world um, with adult uh, COVID we were able to um, hospitals were able to expand they were able to um, even move into sometimes pediatric um, units with some of their patients etc um, and that reverse process is more challenging um, and has, uh, and is because of the lower numbers to start with, there are fewer staff, um, less equipment, et cetera, uh, able to serve these children. So been, it's been quite a, quite a challenge and a lot of discussions on how to prevent that in the future. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that for those diseases and let's talk about some other things. I wanna mention that, um, of course, the pandemic had impact on other diseases. So what, what happened? And I want to mention, usually we rely on the National Immunization Survey from CDC that compares us to other states. How are we doing? How are we doing over time? And that national survey, it will not be available this year until January. Um, usually we get it out in September or so. So I don't have that to look at, but let's talk about what we do, what we do now. First of all, our cases of diseases, and you can see I've kind of grouped these by vaccines, so DTP, Diphtheria, we have had no cases since 1975, looking good there. Tetanus, um, last case, you can see here, we get a case of tetanus every few years, usually in seniors who um, either immigrated from countries where they uh, didn't get vaccinated at all, or, uh, or even are US born, but just never got their boosters and haven't been vaccinated for a long time. Um, so we get a case every few years, but no cases recently. Pertussis is the most interesting from what we're talking about here today. Look at that. Um, pertussis, similarly to influenza, really got uh, wiped out. I mean, historically, if you look back to, here's to 1987, we've never seen numbers this low, um, almost certainly related to the social distancing, masking, and other measures that were put in place uh, for COVID. 
Uh, this has been published already in a couple uh, papers. Um, this is what was seen here. There's a couple papers. I found one from France, and you can see that's what happened to the pertussis in France during the pandemic, and this from England. And again, you can see that uh, uh, dramatic decreases were seen, um, and I think we'll continue to see this from other countries as well. In the United States as a whole, now you, what you'll notice is there's been a general, um, pertussis tends to kind of come in waves, um, and there has been a general decline over the last several years, uh, but you look at this um, sharp decrease in 2020 and in 2021, um, almost certainly due again to those uh, measures taken during the pandemic. So what about polio? Um, important um, disease, in, as you all know, because of what happened here in, in 2022. So again, we have not had a case in, in Idaho uh, since 1982. I, this is before my time, but I'm, I'm certainly, this was an uh, imported case, you know, from some, probably a, retur probably a returning traveler. Um, and as you all know, this is what the story of polio in the United States that we were all sitting back on our laurels for <laughs> years now. Um, 1994, Americas were all certified as polio free. There's been a big initiative to eliminate polio worldwide. And, um, they were hoping to actually have that accomplished by 2000, clearly did not happen. But the United States was able to switch to inactivated polio vaccine in 2000 uh, because uh, there was no longer circulating wild type um, virus and there was a slight, small, but not zero risk of actually um, these uh, vaccine live viruses reverting to be become paralytic, uh, causing a paralytic disease. So why hasn't it been eliminated? And I, obviously that's a, that's a whole other lecture, but in, in short, when I read about it, there are two main barriers. One is that, um, as many of you know, in war-torn countries um, or um, countries where vaccination was not supported, uh, especially by local religious leaders, there have been disruptions in vaccination programs. So there have been problems um, really vaccinating the whole world to try to uh, eliminate circulation. Secondly, of course, the problem I already alluded to, which is the that the oral polio virus vaccine itself can revert and cause paralysis. Most countries have gone to inactivated vaccine now, but there are a few um, where the live vaccine is still used. And now it's very complicated, but it, it may be necessary to use uh, the live vaccine in, in some situations. So what happened in the United States was in July, of course, the New York State said they had a case of paralytic polio and an unimmunized adult who had not traveled. That's what got everybody's attention. Um, and th in that county, they the vaccination rate uh, for children was only about 60%. Uh, there are some religious communities there and others who do not uh, routinely vaccinate. Um, and uh, so they have very low vaccination rate. They tested their sewage, of course, and then found uh, this vaccine-derived poliovirus in the water. So the va this young man was infected with a vaccine-derived um, virus. Not clear where, they never figured out where he, but it's a fecal oral spread. Uh, but uh, the fact that it was in the wastewater suggested that it was truly, it was, this wasn't just a single import importation, say, this was circulating. So a shock wave through the health and medical community for sure. So how are we doing? Um, if you look at our, um, uh, our ch young infant vaccination rates, um, you can look here, you say, wow, we're doing really great. Um, our, in Idaho, we're at about 93%. Um, and yet um, you can see that uh, in New York is also at that point. And that what that shows you is that this has to be local and focal uh, focus, that a statewide rate shouldn't be too reassuring. As a reminder, um, paralytic polio is, is such a rare manifestation. When you have a case, I think of it as a canary in a coal mine. Um, we know that uh, most people will be completely asymptomatic, and there's probably a large um, pool of asymptomatically infected uh, people. So wh what what needs to be done here? Um, this is the worldwide map, and you can see here, um, no surprise, Afghanistan-Pakistan border is uh, until, where until really about a year ago was the only, considered to be the only place in the world where 
um, wild type polio was still circulating. And you can see the cases there that have been um, discovered. These are all wild type polio one. Um, however, more recently um, in Malawi and Mozambique area, there have been more cases. And our EIS officer who was assigned to Idaho from CDC, she just came back from Malawi where she spent um, about a month there working with their uh, vaccination efforts as they try to um, vaccinate to try to uh, stop this outbreak here. But notably, all these other cases and outbreaks are vaccine derived strains, including there we go, there's, there's our US case. So you can see here how the problem of how to get rid of these vaccine derived strains um, uh, is, is gonna be a huge challenge going forward. So next step, I wanna mention for the United States, what do we do now that we've had at least one case? We know it's circulating in at least one um, state. Uh, so the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices has established a work group to talk about whether polio vaccination recommendations should be changed um, in the United States or in regions of the country in light of the New York case. It may not be necessary, but they want, they're gonna be talking about it, haven't talked about it for years. Uh, and that is supposed to be discussed at the February ACIP meeting, so stay tuned. Also, CDC just announced um, at the end of November that they are going to do expand wastewater testing for polio. Uh, this does not include Idaho right now, but uh, I, th I think Michigan and Pennsylvania, I believe, are the two states where they will. Be oh, yeah, it's right here on the. It's right here on my slide. Uh, Michigan and, and the Philadelphia Department of Public Health will be uh, piloting this effort to see how widespread this problem might be. Okay, quickly, measles, mumps, rubella. I, I'm gonna, not gonna belabor this, but the good news is we have not seen an increase in any of those diseases. Um, you know, we have a case or two of, of mumps most years and that has stayed about the same. However, a lot of concerns about measles um, in light of the fact that many uh, vaccination campaigns were disrupted uh, during the pandemic, uh, leading to a lot more un, under immunized or unimmunized kids. This is a really cool paper published in MMWR looking at 10 jurisdictions and Idaho was included because our registry is so robust. You can see Idaho, lucky for us is the solid dark line, very easy to see. And you can see here as the lockdown happened, how MMR doses administered dropped uh, dramatically as you'd expect over 80%, about 80% in Idaho, I should say, uh, and did recover uh, but the recovery here from that is not enough to have caught all these kids up. So we know there's a group of kids in Idaho and in other states uh, who have not, who have missed their MMRs and are probably under immunized. And you'll see, um, I'll talk a little bit more of that in a second. So what about, uh, what about, are we seeing anything in the, in the, in the nation as far as measles cases? There's definitely been a little bit of a rise here. 2022 isn't over yet. And most concerningly in Ohio, they now have a large measles outbreak going on, uh, 81 cases, um, almost all unvaccinated. Remember some of them are, you don't get your first dose till you're 12 months of age. So some of these uh, little kiddos were just too young to have been vaccinated. Um, there is a way you can move those vaccines earlier and I, Ohio is looking into that. You can give it as, month, as young as six months in a outbreak. So they are uh, exploring and may have already started doing that. But you can see here almost all these kids were had um, were unimmunized or had only received one dose. Uh, none of them had received two doses. Um, 29 have been hospitalized out of 81. That's a pretty impressive hospitalization rate. Uh, in fact, higher than expected. I was on a call recently with Ohio discussing um, they aren't sure why they're seeing such a high hospitalization rate. Obviously, things they could be missing cases. Um, uh, they're not. They're not sure. They, a lot of these were babies. So that's probably one reason why. And you can see here, uh, they're hopeful that maybe um, the uh, outbreak is is settling down. Uh, but one case of measles can be uh, the average number of people infected uh, with uh, from measles from if they're unimmunized is 12. So it's a very, very, very infectious disease. So you can't feel comfortable until you're seeing zeros. Um, across the board. So this is the part of Ohio that that outbreak is in. Again, as already meant in the United States, we tend to have very good coverage against measles, uh, 90% or more. Um, and 
we can feel pretty good about that. But if you look at uh, kids entering kindergarten, they're supposed to have another shot before they come into kindergarten. This is looking at 24 months. Did they get their baby shots as it were? Once they come into kindergarten though, our rate drops off. And this is almost certainly kids who have not gotten that pre-kindergarten uh, dose. Um, so there's a bit of a concern that uh, kids in the school age may not be fully protected. So I think this is my last um, disease topic. Uh, what happened to monkeypox and now called, first of all, you should know it's now MPOX. Uh, WHO has officially, uh, there's a kind of a one year transition period where either term is acceptable just to, so it's not too confusing and there's time to change websites and ICD-10 codes and all sorts of things. Uh, but uh, most of us are now referring to it as MPOX. So the outbreak, as you know, affect, uh, United States reported more cases than any other country. Um, uh, but fortunately, we had zero deaths reported. There have been deaths reported around the world, but not in the United States. Um, and you can see here the number of cases reported has been dropping off dramatically. The last day on this little, on this graph was the 14th where five cases were reported in the United States. So that's really, really good news. In Idaho, um, we have not had a case. Um, this is by illness onset since September 29th. And um, uh, we were able to um, administer, a, a, you know, certainly did not get the coverage we, we were hoping to get, but we got a large number of vaccination um, clinics that went out and a lot of partners around the state helping to make sure these folks got vaccinated. Some of you were aware uh, the Central District Health Department did a great job doing a uh, clinic at the Balcony Club during uh, Boise Pride. Um, and here's a picture with the health, uh, we health and welfare um, actually set up a separate, separate booth down on the grounds of the, uh, with all the tents in the tent city of Boise Pride and between the two um, clinics we're able to vaccinate quite a number of people. So we're very happy about that. So what are the next steps for MPOX? Um, one is that, again, the CDC's advisory committee, always busy, um, is actually now evaluating the current recommendations for MPOX. Um, it's like, okay, so cases are going down. Do we continue to vaccinate? Does this just become a routine vaccine? For example, in uh, men who have sex with men, does this become, um, should, this, should this effort continue? And then secondarily, are there other populations? Um, for example, there was a death reported recently, and this was an immunocompromised household member um, of someone who had MPOX. Um, the, the primary case um, survived was a young man, uh, but his household member was immunocompromised and ended up dying. Um, God, I just told you there were no deaths. So how did that, hmm, let me ponder this, that maybe my, uh, my numbers there might've been outdated because this was just reported in MWR recently. So that might, um, that might lead to a recommendation, for example, that if you are immunocompromised and you have a household member, let's say, who is a sexually active MSM, that you as an immunocompromised person may uh, consider this vaccine. Um, stay tuned, uh, no decisions have been made. I think this is gonna be discussed in February, but I'm not exactly sure that hasn't been formally announced yet. So I'm gonna, wrap up um, by saying, and I'm hoping I'm leaving enough time for, I know we wanted to have a little wrap up and round table as the last session of the year, um, or the last session, I should say, of COVID. Uh, key points, uh, of course, the respiratory diseases continue to circulate widely, as I'm sure you saw. Um, some other vaccine preventable diseases were impacted during the pandemic, including pertussis that I really pointed out. I didn't have the time to include, but some of you that also um, follow TB, may have known that there were drops in TB cases. Some of that might have been good news, meaning um, true um, prevention of uh, respiratory spread because of social distancing, say. Uh, there's also concern though that uh, cases just weren't um, diagnosed as off. People were avoiding medical care and we might see a surge in TB. So that remains to be seen. Uh, measles and polio uh, may spread. That's what you saw those two examples that were concerned about um, because of what happened in New York with polio and then because of measles outbreaks, for example, the one in Ohio going on right now. Um, so we need to keep a close eye on that. And then lastly, uh, MPOX, oh, I misspelled it, sorry about that, MPEX decreasing dramatically. 
uh, but uh, long-term strategies are needed and not yet sorted out about um, who to keep vaccinating going forward. Um, will there be future surges, et cetera? We don't know, but we're, we're happy to have what appeared to be a public health success with, um, and it wasn't just vaccine, of course, it was um, the impacted community, uh, changing behaviors, um, education, awareness, and so forth. Um, so that, that was all good news. And I'll leave it at that. Dr. Hahn, thank you so much for that overview. And we're really grateful for you carving time out to join us. Oh, sure. So let's open it up to questions. I, you can either put those in the chat or ask directly by unmuting. Uh, Chris, I put in a, uh, in the chat uh, an interesting uh, notes from the field uh, article from 2011 about a, a diphtheria-like illness. Um, because I noticed that wasn't on your graph. Yes. Yeah, we have, you know, for that, we have pretty strict, I'm looking for your link, Sky, but we have, uh, as you know, that was uh, pretty strict. I don't see it, Sky, are you sure you threw it in there? Um, yeah, it, it's at uh, uh, 1232. It was just the MMWR uh, article from that notes from the field from that case that we had. Um, oh, there it is. I see. Okay, it's not hyperlinked. I got it now. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That was a very interesting case. Thanks for, for mentioning that. Yeah. It was not a true diphtheria for everybody else. It's a, it's a similar carinobacterium. And it's a fascinating disease because the, the toxin is encoded by a bacterial phage. So uh, it was a Carinobacterium ulcerans that was, had the bacteriophage that created the toxin. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that case, Guy. That was really interesting. I have a question since we're, uh, unless other people, of course, have burning questions, but as I mentioned, I am struggling to just help me understand why we. Um, struggle with our, let's say, our flu vaccination rates, for example, and our COVID vaccination rates, and yet in our seniors, uh, we seem to have even do better sometimes than the national average. If anybody has any great insights, I'd be curious, especially those of you that, looking at you, Megan, that work with seniors a lot and might have some insights. I mean, do we do a better job of getting, uh, of seniors having access or getting into care or, you know, just I would love yeah. to know what the secret is so we can expand it to other <laughs> <groups>. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you my two cents and then I would love to hear from everybody else too. Um, so I think two, two thoughts. One is um, in my like journey of becoming a geriatrician um, in my MPH work, um, 12 years, however the heck long ago that was, um, I was really interested in geriatric patient activation. Um, and sort of what factors lead, um, especially older adults, to engage in their healthcare versus not. Not surprisingly, um, a lot of the tools that were developed at that time, the, the one that I used was the patient activation measure um, by a gal out of OHSU. Um, but they weren't really, you know, tested or validated in older adult populations at the same level as they were in younger people, much less in folks who have cognitive impairments or people who are in caregiving dyads. And so that was that was what I did my little master's of public health um, study on. And the thing that we found was that socioeconomic um, factors, you know, really were amplified the more birthdays you have. And so the things that precluded people from, you know, having, you know, reasonable access to healthcare earlier in life um, became even more um, significant later in life. Um, beyond that, it was just not a lot that I found, but when you look at like the, the patient activation measure or, um, geriatric sort of, um, patient engagement and, and health engagement, um, it's all over the map and we're kind of in a, in a transition between, you know, two generations, right? We're, we're at the very, very tail end of sort of the greatest generation, the, the, the World War II folks, and they were highly compliant, you know, stereotypically, right? These are archetypes, not, you know, not meant to be applied on a, the person in front of you basis, but then sort of looking at this generation that's that's sort of aging now, right? There's a lot of heterogeneity in their experience with the healthcare system. There's a lot of distrust and mistrust. 
um, their experience of, of technology. And so it's really, it's dynamic and it's changing um, quickly. So that's sort of answer one, um, which is to say, I have no idea. And then answer two um, is, you know, the push in, back in, you know, CMS, what, 2013, 2014 to institute through the Affordable Care Act, um, the Medicare annual wellness visit, and every PCP on here is like, ah, groaning. <laughs> the annual wellness visit, I said it, it's a bad word, um, but it does get people into their doctor's office um, and their provider's office at a higher rate than before. Um, and when we're looking at value-based care, right, like practices are incentivized to check the box to make sure that influenza vaccine is happening to make sure that, you know, there's not a box to be checked for COVID vaccine yet, parentheses, every PCP is now groaning again, sorry. Um, but, I, but I do, my, my two cents is that, you know, number one, um, the heterogeneity of people's experiences with the healthcare system are amplified in old age, not, you know, sort of not standardized and the health disparities do seem to be amplified. And then the second is that, you know, in places where it is working, um, it's potentially because of more access or more touch points with the healthcare system, including, but not limited to the Medicare well, annual wellness. But somebody please jump in and teach me things because I this is just off the cuff. Hi, this is Paul Carvalho. Um, Chris, fantastic talk. And Meg, thank you for your response. You, you covered a lot of points. Um, I'm at the VA and the Although we, our veterans are not exclusively geriatric, we have a very high proportion of geriatric patients. And so one of the things that the VA has done is kind of entice the patients to come in and get their shots. They will do whatever's needed. Um, um, what is that? That, that um, so Some of the grocery de departments, uh, Trader Joe's for one, brings flowers. We get we have flowers every day. And so the veterans would come in, get a shot, get some flowers to take home to their wives or husbands. And so that was one of the enticements. There's coffee clinics. There's drive throughs where you just stick your arm out and they shoot you and you're on your way. So they've made it extremely easy to do this. Every time a patient comes in for a visit, regardless for anything else, you know, from hearing aids to pulmonary clinic, they, of course, get asked, have, have you had it? Where have you had it? Et cetera. They've set up some clinics uh, with, um, um, I think it's Walgreens that, that they have an agreement with. So the access is tremendous. In contrast, my husband, my friends, they go to Albertsons and there's a 45 minute waiting line. And so sometimes people say, oh, I'm not, this is not a good day and I don't have time and they leave. And then that gets delayed. So, so I think just some of the creativity that some places are using to get the patients in to get the shots um, for these older patients works well. Well, I thought of one more thing. Um, populations uh, residing in, in you know, living facilities, um, institutional care settings, we did see a much higher rate of COVID vaccine uptake initially in those during that pandemic too. And I think that's attributable to just CMS regulations. Um, the incentive structure around vaccination of residents in those settings. So the patients, you know, the older adults um, initially was around like, we can allow you more freedoms in terms of activities and, and restrictions and that type of thing. And um, so I do wonder how much of that population has contributed to those numbers too. I don't know. What's your what's your take on that? Speaking as one very elderly person, I think the, one of the reasons we get shots is because we're really not ready to go yet. So that's a good reason to protect ourselves. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate all your comments. Thank you, Paula and Megan. I agree with you. I think the activities in the long-term care facilities, the, you know, we get lists now of, uh, in fact, I was just looking at one yesterday of the different uh, uptake rates, especially now for now, of course, we're focused on the bivalent booster and it's, it varies widely across the skilled nursing facilities, but we don't have, and, and we are focusing now working with Comag and Health on the low, the nursing facilities that have the low, the low uptake. Um, but uh, the folks that live in um, 
in obviously out in the community or in assisted living, we don't have good visibility there. And I wish we, I wish we had better visibility and could help support uh, those folks to get vaccinated more as well.